Good morning. It's still morning. A juice, but while I'm a week or so called, I sucked Cadahortum Lord Ascalia, our sparer. I've just thanked you in the Irish language <laughs> for extending to me the privilege of addressing you in the English language. <laughs> Because I gave you two of the four words that I understand in Norwegian. I said, good morning, and when I finish, I'll give you the other two. <laughs> I'm very happy to bring you greetings of solidarity from ETUS, which is the European region of Education International. ETUS represents 11 million education trade unionists in 129 unions in 45 countries right across the continent of Europe. So sometimes I think you will agree research can be a lonely profession. I want to remind you, you are not alone. You are part of a major movement. You are part of a family of 11 million colleagues who wants to have your back, to give you support, and to be a voice articulating on your behalf. Can I say, by the way, that I am very pleased that in the title that you have given to my intervention, you have referred to the Knowledge Society. Because in my country, especially with the influence of neoliberalism, we often talk about the knowledge economy. We don't live in economies. We live in societies. We should prioritize societies over economies at every stage. You've probably already noticed that there's no sign of me doing PowerPoint. I confess that the main reason is because I am hopeless at PowerPoint. I'm really bad at it. So I thought I would try to turn that failing into a virtue. And that because I don't have PowerPoint, that perhaps we could engage more directly. I will provide to your colleagues my speaking notes for today, so you will be able to check on the references. But in the meantime, I apologize for the fact that you're going to have to listen to me even more carefully, because you will not have my words on screen. On the other hand, maybe this is fortuitous, because the Irish poet, William Butler Yeats, famously said that education is not the filling of a bucket. Education is the lighting of a fire. And to create a spark, sometimes we need that direct engagement. I remember when I was in my first year in university, we had two lecturers in the history department one of whom spoke very, very slowly. And it was possible to write down every word he said <laughs> until you fell asleep. <laughs> The other was passionate about history, passionate about his topic. And he fired out words like, like bullets out of a machine gun. <laughs> And even the Roman Catholic nuns who used to sit in the front, who wrote down every word, they couldn't keep up. So what did we do? We sat back and we allowed the enthusiasm to carry us away. And more often than not, after his lecture, I went to the library to pursue more 
the ideas that he had enthused me in. And I believe, in that sense, gave me a greater possibility of self-education and real education. I quoted William Butler Yeats. In this context about education, I also like to quote Albert Einstein. Everybody knows Albert Einstein, the scientist. I like the memory of Albert Einstein as one of the foremost academic trade unionists. Einstein said, the purpose of education is not the learning of facts, but inspiring the mind to think of things that cannot be learned from textbooks. He also said controversially, education is what remains after one has forgotten what one learned in school. It is about imparting knowledge, but sometimes more important, imparting the thirst for knowledge that we must never lose sight of. I want to talk about the slow science movement and the imperative of allowing space and time for academics to think. Because without this time and space, academics will fail in what is a mission, some would say a sacred mission, to discover new ideas, original ideas. And if that is the effect, then society will suffer. We must not let that happen. But I want to say to you that slow science is not a recent phenomenon. I'm sure you've all heard of Sir Isaac Newton and the theory of gravity. Where was he when he came up with the theory of gravity? He was sitting underneath a tree and an apple fell on his head. When was the last time you got paid to sit under a tree? James Watt, the famous Scottish engineer who perfected the steam engine, he said that he got his inspiration from sitting in his mother's kitchen watching a pot boil. We don't get paid for sitting in our kitchens anymore. You may have heard of Dr. Andrew Wiles, who famously cracked the mystery of Fermat's last theorem in mathematics. I know nothing about Fermat's last theorem, but I know it's very important. Do you know how long Andrew, Wiley spent, Andrew Wiles spent dealing with Fermat's last theorem? 25 years. None of you will be given 25 years to work on any project, I guarantee you. I like to tell the story about the, um, the head, the president or the vice chancellor, I'm not sure of the actual title, of the University of Aarhus in Denmark, who made a speech full of self-congratulation about what a wonderful university it had become under his leadership. And he said he was particularly proud because on faculty they had for the first time an academic who had been honored with a Nobel Prize. That was a big mistake. He shouldn't have said that. Because that academic pointed out to the head of the university that if the rules that he introduced for approval of research and approval of research products, if those rules had been in place when the Nobel laureate started his research, he would have been declined support for lack of relevance because too few people in the world knew what he was doing. There are other aspects to slow science. 
In Ireland, we have a very famous and much loved political cartoonist. And he's very fond of saying that almost every day he has to explain to his wife that even though he's sitting staring out the window, that's the hardest and most productive work he will do all day. You may not be familiar with Alexis Ohanian, but if you read the likes of Hello! magazine and sports, you might know him better as Mr. Serena Williams. He was quoted recently as saying that some of his best ideas come when he had nothing to do and he just lets his mind wander. Do we have any license anymore to let our minds wander? Would Sir Isaac Newton, James Watt, Andrew Miley, while, while any of these, would they have received funding from corporate sponsors? I don't think so. How would they survive in the current ideology, which I sum up as more efficiency? Doing more with less. Being relevant. Accumulating the maximum number of citations, preferably in only certain specified so-called high-end journals. The attitude of, never mind the quality, what about the quantity? The attitude of, we must be accountable, not to society, accountable to our funders. And the idea that, at all costs, we must go upwards in international rankings international league tables which are promulgated by the ranking agencies. If you think of the scientists and others that I have mentioned, ask yourself, what was it that protected them and gave them the space that they needed to deliver original work? The answer is job security autonomy, academic freedom, respect. These aren't mere slogans for us. These are trade union issues. These are vital prerequisites for the fostering of original and groundbreaking research. Because, colleagues, precarious employment is the opposite to security. Ask yourself, what academic or researcher who is on a temporary or hourly paid contract, which of them is going to take the risk or have the time to engage in new groundbreaking research? You know the answer. Without job security, there can be no academic freedom. Without job security and academic freedom, there is no room, no space for curiosity. Without curiosity, there is no originality, no new learning, no new horizons. We have to demand a tolerance for failure. If we don't have a tolerance for failure, no one will depart from the safe zone of what we already know. We need to be free to ask questions because we don't know the answer. We need to be allowed to take a voyage into uncertainty. Now, I know that you Norwegians, like us Irish, both had country people, country men as they were, who discovered America. Unfortunately, you didn't get the credit, and we didn't get the credit. 
So everybody thinks Columbus did it. Well, when Columbus headed out on his publicly funded voyage, remember, he didn't know where he was going, and he didn't expect to find what he found when he got there. And when he got there, he wasn't sure what he had found. <laughs> Other explorers like Magellan, Thomas Cook, Vasco da Gama, all of these great explorers were publicly funded to head into the unknown precisely because it was the unknown. That doesn't happen now. Another Irish writer, you know I can't resist the temptation of quoting Irish writers. I'm sorry, you have to indulge my chauvinism. George Bernard Shaw has said, there are those that look at things the way they are and they ask why. I dream of things that never were and I ask, why not? Is there space for us to do that? Can we do it with private funding? For instance, what pharmaceutical company is going to provide the finances to do research on drug-free responses to illness? What financial institution is going to sponsor research into community-level funding projects? We need altruistic funders, and the best source of altruistic funding has to come from public policy and the public purse. In Ireland, we have had the great pleasure recently of re-electing a very, very popular president, Michael D. Higgins. And we in the Irish Federation of University Teachers are tremendously proud of the fact that before he entered into politics, he was a university academic. And he has kept that personality of being a university academic throughout all his time, seven years so far in office, He's just been returned with the highest vote ever achieved in an Irish election by an individual. So we don't need to be coy and shy and nervous about being academics. We can be proud. Mind you, Michael D. Higgins has said recently that he regards the current obsession in higher education with metrics as being an ideological fad. I hope he's right. I hope it's temporary. But he also says, albeit quoting another person, that nowadays, when academics want to do research into precarious employment, the good news is they no longer need to do any fieldwork. All they have to do is open the door of their office and look down the corridor and see the precariously employed colleagues. Now, in a recent presentation to my union, the question was asked about academics. Are we dossers? I don't know if you're familiar with the word dossers. It is actually in the English language, although we think of it as being an Irish word. A dosser is somebody who is not just lazy, but is manipulative and a shirker. The accusation I throw out there is because it's important, because when we demand academic freedom and we demand time and space, we are met with cynicism and we find that people are inclined to believe that we can't be trusted with such latitude, because if we are not forced to do the work, we won't do it. Well, the research shows that that is not true. And in the notes I give you, I will give you a document. Uh, I will give you the source of these quotations. But there was a, a major pan-European study done, including Norway, with regard to uh, academic workload. And it showed that senior academics, on average, work 48 hours per week. Now, that's 20% more than the typical work schedule of full-time employees. In Ireland, it's actually 50 hours. Junior academics across Europe work on average 42 hours. 
seven, 47 in Ireland. Obviously, we're harder working in Ireland for some reason. <laughs> and interestingly, in Europe, senior academics spend 7% of their time on service to the community and 22% of their time on administration. You know, researchers, even if we were to flick a switch and give them more freedom, there isn't that much time left in the working week when you engage in the preparation of research projects, do international collaboration, publish academic papers, act as peer reviewers, serve on international scientific committees, all of these broken down in an article about the workload of researchers in Europe. Again, I'll give you the reference in the notes, which I'll supply to your colleagues. And in the same document, it said, pressure to increase research productivity are a threat to the quality of research. And it has also been said, the pursuit of excellence is at risk of being reduced to a narrow pursuit of high-profile league tables. So the facts show that we can be trusted. We are not dossers. We are hard workers. We are conscientious. But this isn't enough. Because, colleagues, with the growth of managerialism in higher education worldwide in the last number of years, more and more academics find themselves to be under the direction not of their peers, but of administrators who know little or nothing about the field of study in which they're engaged. This is why we have to refight certain battles that we have admittedly lost in the last decade and more not just for institutional autonomy, not just for academic freedom, but also for the majority control of the direction in our universities and higher education to be exercised by our peers. I have a quote, autonomy along with academic freedom is intrinsic to the nature of the university and a precondition if a university is to best fulfill its role and its responsibilities towards society. So I am suggesting that our movement, our trade union movement, on behalf of those who work in education, primarily my interest is in higher education, has to engage in this political struggle. And I suggest that perhaps our slogan could be and again, I'm quoting from Albert Einstein. If you insist on measuring all that is valuable, you're going to end up valuing only that which is measurable. And finally, in this protest, I'm looking out at you. I'm hoping that the vast majority of you have been on protest marches. I've been on more than I've had hot dinners. And you know how it is. What do we want? Higher pay. When do we want it? Now. Well, we researchers, maybe we're a bit more sedate. So how about, what do we want? The job security, the time, the freedom, and the space to conduct original groundbreaking research. <laughs> when do we want it? Following consultation with our peers, <laughs> in a spirit of academic freedom, in the context of institutional autonomy. Tusen tak. Thank you.